wholesale. Wholesale. So we're starting out with a Cherokee greeting, but then we're saying, Buenos tardes, <laughs> senores and senoras. Si, buenos tardes. Buenos tardes. Bueno, bueno. Um, I'll continue with, with, it looks like a theme I'm having these past weeks, you know, for Mexico, or Mexico, uh, like that. So I'm, I'm going on with that. And today, in particular, I'm titling this, you know, Zorro. Zorro and we'll say something like the masks of Mexico, uh, like that. Now, I actually have a painting that I've done for that. This is my painting up here. This is Zorro. Now, people in other parts of the country may not have heard of Zorro. He's a legendary character of early Spanish and Spanish-Mexican California here. And uh, he's a kind of a Robin Hood in England, in old England. Robin Hood is a Saxon who is, you know, uh, making a difference, if not an outright resistance, to the invading Normans. So we have a little bit of that here in this uh, era of Zorro. Uh, he's a legendary character. He seems to have had something to do in terms of forming who he is to an actual historical character called Joaquin Marietta, a kind of a notorious bandito, if that, that would be all right to say that, you know, but certainly by, of somebody who is historically known in that way. Uh, Zorro is kind of a double, you know, alter ego kind of fellow here. Uh, in his, you know, regular life, he is Don Diego, I think, Viejas or Vargas. Um, and he lives in the Pueblo of Los Angeles, now Los Angeles. And uh, he's a Californian, a Californian in this period at the end of the Spanish, in other words, the episodes seem to include uh, a Spanish garrison, uh, these kind of people that were here while this part of California was still part of New Spain here. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, another part of, of it that makes it even more legible, evidently, Zorro is a Basque. You know, that to me is pretty important in the sense that as the population from other parts of the United States have influxed into uh, this region, uh, the earlier people, Californios and Basque, have been kind of ignored. but. We do have, you know, a considerable Basque presence here in early California. Uh, down here in Old Town, there's a restaurant in Old Town that's Pedorenas. Pedorenas, a Basque. And Los Angeles had a considerable a Basque population. Uh, Basques in Spain are very, very ancient people. No known relative, uh, known of the language of those. Uh, in Spain, a Basque is called, you know, a Vascos or a Vascones there. And their main place is in the Pyrenees, that would be eastern Spain, the mountain range between Spain and France, you know, is the Pyrenees. Now, I reckon because I heard uh, sometime Zorro say he's carrying on this Zorro tradition from his grandfather, who was from the Pyrenees. So, certainly he's a Basque. And some of the episodes look like, you know, he does have some contentions with the Spanish contingent, you know, here. Later, it's the incoming or invading Anglo-Americans uh, come in. Um, in Baja, Baja still has many old-time families of the Spanish. Some of them definitely had, their ancestors were Spanish soldiers. And KPBS, you know, definitely has a weekly program of Elsa Sevilla, who, you know, shows us, you know, little vignettes from early California, and including the people who live in uh, Baja from Spanish ancestry. And we found when we went to Baja uh, some years ago that Zorro still, you know, was, was there. He, he still, you know, has his, his sword uh, there. So there's been uh, several movies made of Zorro. The recent one that I know of is Anthony Hopkins, 
and I didn't think he was a very good Zorro, really. <laughs> Earlier ones, Antonio Bandara and others, these are all actual movies, we would call them. But then there's been two, um, we call them serials, like on TV. And for my youngsterhood, um, I saw later, you know, that there's a much later one, but it doesn't have the same tone as the earlier uh, one, is more serious, of Zorro. And so that definitely, you know, gave me an introduction into Zorro for somebody, me, who's living uh, in Southern California and also having some ancestry by way of Don Juan Jose Juarez. Um, that's my patronym, uh, who was also a California rancher at this time here. Uh, when you think of all this, Old Town, you know, has been sort of recreated or recaptured <laughs> to have something of that time, and it's the buildings have been refurnished to reflect, you know, that, that particular period of time. <clears throat> and so it's important that both for Mexico, for people's being acquainted or get, getting knowledge from about Mexico, also California as Spanish California. Now, the Basque, evidently, uh, there's, in other words, recent evidence has come to light that there may have been Basques here that were before the Spanish. Now, when we say Spanish, we're saying something that's really a mouthful, because Spain is really España, meaning all. So you have several states, countries, excepting Portugal, who wouldn't join uh, the all, uh, almost like saying United of Iberia is who they all are. The flag <coughs> reflects um, the symbols of Castile and Aragon. And a few years ago, a Spanish ship, a ship, you know, with uh, sails and a, and a big uh, mass and things like that, you know, came into San Diego. I didn't hear it said, but I reckoned it was the first time a Spanish flagged ship had been in this country since, what is it, 1850, like that. So that was very interesting because I pulled up right next to the dock. And Randy went, and I went down there. I was very, very interested in that, in, in a Spanish ship here, like that. And so we were, you know, like that, uh, uh, visiting the ship. And while we were there, here comes another fellow. He comes up here and what it turns out to be is that he's a Basque and he's wearing what is characteristic of Basque's headgear. He's wearing a, a beret, a little beret. And, and he's telling us that you know, he, that's who he is. And the sailors on the Spanish ship got very agitated. It was really something to see. They all kind of got to the side of the ship and they were just kind of agitated visibly. And then one of them, an officer, Came off, came off of the ship and came right up to him and speaking to him in Spanish like that. And the Basque is answering, to him, we're, we're not in Spain and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> you know, so the agitated Spanish officer went back aboard the ship and then uh, the Basque man, he told us yeah, he had very good reason for coming down here and agitating them. <laughs> uh, I think Gregory Peck starred in a movie, I don't remember what it was, something like, it seems like the gun of Navarra. Navarra is a major town or city, you know, on the border of the Pyrenees there. Uh, and anyway, in the movie, I remember he's, he's wearing a, a beret. Uh, there's a west side and the east side to the Pyrenees, and they have different color hats. I don't remember what it is that would tell you from the, you're from the west or the east side of those mountains there. So that's all mixed in with this. Basically, uh, Zorro is like the Robin Hood I mentioned. Uh, he stands you know, for, for justice and he has a rapier sword and he makes you know like Z mark like that. Uh, whether he brands a coward on his cheek or, or in somebody's drapery uh, like that. That's the kind of sword, a kind of a French sword that he carries. And also, um, 
he very legendary has a certain kind of way that he dresses. Certainly he wears a mask. And I don't remember what period in Spain exactly, but it became very fashionable for people to wear a mask. Uh, like a mask and basically a cloak like that. So that's pretty much the way that uh, the character Zorro is attired in that way. And here in my painting, I would say, what I portrayed him is, he's wearing this woven uh, blanket, it is what it is, uh, and it's called a panto, or poncho in English. And that's very interesting because the name itself, panto, and its style has come from South America, from the uh, Arundak, uh, the Arundak people, Indians, like that, and became kind of a hallmark for American Spaniards, Mestizos, and Creoles in that way to wear it. Basically, you know, it's a, a wool woven blanket with a hole in the middle to put your, your head through that. And this particular one, I have a particular style because I lived in the high mountains of Michoacan at Lake Pascuaro, seven feet high, uh, and the Traskans, who are the people there, are also very prolific weavers, very much so. And so I actually did have a poncho with this design on it that I was wearing here. So to know that's you know, somewhat a, a, a insignia almost of American Spaniards. And also his sombrero, what he's wearing there, that's called a Siviano. And uh, ostensibly from the uh, town or province of Sevilla in southern Spain, which is uh, on the, the river of Guadalajara. So that seems to be very particular. And in episodes, however Rizarro is portrayed, uh, he seems to always be wearing a Siviano. Now, the people in California, Californios, whatever parts of Spain that they may have come from, including the Basques, were kind of, you know, a uh, alternate republic or something, and that they uh, dressed in a way that would, for their time, be very, very liberal. And when English Americans happened to venture over here to Spanish and Mexican California, they were somewhat taken aback, if not mildly shocked, at the way that the people here dressed. And here to illustrate that, here is my portrait of a California lady at the time of Zorro. And she's wearing in my portrait here a Siviano here. Uh, this may be Claudia. Uh, we used to attend you know, fiestas in Old Town where Claudia was dressed appropriately and she also wore a Siviano. So I think that this is a very good illustration of the way a California woman in the earlier times would appear. So that's a very good way to be seeing that here. Uh, starting off again with the masks, uh, in Mexico, uh, we have many, many masks. And so that's where I'm going to start with. This is my painting here. This little painting is, is a Mexican man uh, wearing a mask. This kind of mask, you know, with his color and everything, would be portraying like in the Passion Play, uh, basically Latinos, uh, Spaniards, or whoever uh, is not Indian. So, but that is my a little oil painting for that. And that sort of begins, you know, this uh, display that I have for that. Uh, kind of going along with that, if you come over to this mask here, I've had this mask for a long time. I actually brought it back from uh, when I was living in Michoacan. You see it has blue eyes and uh, I've rigged it up here with a headdress here but this would probably be a mask similar to this one here. And uh, if we go over to the other side of the painting, 
here's another rendition. Now I don't, some of these I don't know where they're from, but I brought them all from Mexico. So this would also appear to be, you know, in the same range that I'm speaking of what's being portrayed by these masks here. So we can go all the way up here to this one. This one, um, there certainly were, uh, I'm trying to say pre-Spanish, you know, that pre-Columbian is what they call it, uh, masks. And in that pre-Columbian world, these masks were, if I could say, very interchangeable or very mobile in terms of the deities, gods, goddesses, whatever, uh, being masked because the mask has a quality that can be transferred to another deity. So I, I have this here. This small is from uh, the totem office of Veracruz, very smiling mask and a small mask, but it is to represent the pre-Spanish mask tradition throughout uh, Mexican societies. And then you just come right down here to the, this one. This is a very unique mask. This is Yaki, and it's Yaki because it has a black crosses on it. But what it's about is this is a moon mask. And uh, I doubt that they still will use it, so it's unique that I have collected this one. But what it's about is a woman, Yaki woman, who is about to give birth, and it coincides when the constellation of the Pleiades is overhead. It's up there. And this is put over her face. Or we're, we're saying, you know, she's laying down, and this mask is over her face, and on the sides of it are seven little circles to represent the stars of that constellation here. Green, there are green circles, which would mean fertility, and that would tell us, you know, something why this is being used. Uh, these masks, in this sense, you know, definitely have something, uh, energy, quality, or something. They're not just uh, simple, like kids' Halloween masks. There's something to it. They can go down here. This one, I showed this one last week. Again, this is a deity's mask that is, we'll call it the goddess of the Lake Pascuaro. It's a very fine uh, lacquered, black lacquered mask. That's Tarascan. That's the people who are there. And I can kind of go over here to this figure. This is another pre-Columbian figure, and it, I have it here because it relates to the people from Veracruz, Totonacas, and this is interesting. Uh, there's you know quite a few of these. They were made out of clay, and someone has taken one of those and cast it in bronze. So it made it pretty permanent. And uh, uh, I judge that these were made the way they are because they're kind of like seeds to put in the field. Uh, and that's my guess, you know, for that. And, uh, well, let me just go from that to this one I have here in front. I've shown this now and then. Uh, Quetzalcoatl, who is, you know, the major, major uh, deity of Mexico, if we can say that. <laughs> and certainly he still lives in spirit, and he still lives in the masks that are made for him. And so this is a Quetzalcoatl mask, very mysterious which has the carved in it. This is the Quetzal bird. Uh, very, very unique that way. And then if I go over here, here is another, the most soulful uh, Quetzalcoatl mask that I have seen that I've collected uh, here in this country. <clears throat> like that. Then if I can just go right up here, right above them, uh, this appears to be a Yaki mask of a goat. You know, the goat, you know, is the figure for the ceremonial Pascola dancers. And uh, they're usually very small masks like this This is. Uh, he's missing, you know, a cross, so he hasn't been in a ceremony 
But anyway, it's a very good carving for the Pascola mask of the goat. Then I go up above that one. This is a very old mask that I did collect in Mexico. Uh, a very, to me, characteristic of old masks. Uh, whatever play he might have been in, but it, obviously it is a snake. You know, the, the way that it's painted. It's very, very old here. And I, I didn't mention, but I want to come right down here to this because this is a very obvious little clay mask. This is made by Erin, our, our daughter, when she was maybe at Eric's uh, clay studio. Here, so it's a very mask-like here. So we can go over here uh, to this figure here. This is uh, a wooden carving for an owl, and this is from Mexico. And I have it here because you can see the mask-like face, the mask-like face of the, of the owl here, the mask. And then finally, we'll go over here. This is my painting. And this painting, this is actually, I've collected a Mexican-made frame for it. Uh, and I titled this, you know, Santa Samana, Holy Week. And it's one kind of paint, one, I mean, it's like a painting of a kind for me. It's very much the expression of my feelings and my emotions of being in uh, the Aki ceremony in Guadalupe on this particular Holy Week. So the emotions and everything that I put into it that I, I mean to, to be a very uh, sacred, sacred painting of my feelings and I would say the communal feelings of everybody on that particular Holy Week. You know, with the, the tears and everything. So it you know, suggests, you know, a mask like quality. So, very beholding to that. And I believe that I've, I've covered all of the masks here. I can come back to me for, for a minute. Glasses. I've been introducing the Mexican poet Octavio Paz. Uh, and so anything that I might be repeating about that. Um, I did my graduate or, you know, studies for a master's degree in Mexican art history. And also the literary part of it, I did of Mexican poets. And the main one, not the only one, but the main one that I discovered at that time was Octavio Paz there and so many things that he actually said in a reference to my theme, Masks of Mexico, in his book, The Labyrinth of Solitude, he writes about how the Mexican, like, you know, it's generic, every Mexican is masked, you know, is wearing a mask, or can just put it succinctly, the mask of the, Mex the Mexican. So that very much, you know, fits in here. And uh, I hope to be doing further poems of Octavio Paz. Again, all my theme here is to extol, uh, for me, my experience of Mexico, Mexican culture, Mexican myth, and Mexican people. When I was there living in Mexico, and each time that I went, um, I just experienced such beautiful, uh, what do you say, host, hostship, hostmanship, or something uh, like that. So I'm very, very, very much respectful of Mexico and whatever that I've inherited from it. Uh, this poem, Marvillas de la Voluntad, uh, it's called The Marvels of Will. And I've just finished seeing the PBS play of uh, Richard III, in which the, a line in the introduction was also uh, Shakespeare's play is The Will to Power. And so there's something in, in that, that I've, the marvels of will and the will to power. And he starts it off here with whatever you call it, kind of a, a, a poet start, poem start, you know. To pull off the mask of fantasy, 
to drive a spike into that sensitive center to provoke the emotion. At precisely three o'clock, Don Pedro would arrive at our table, greet each customer, bubble to himself, and silently take a seat. He would order a cup of coffee, light a cigarette, listen to the chatter, sip his coffee, pay the waiter, take his hat, say good afternoon, and leave. And so it was, every day. What did Don Pedro say upon sitting and rising with a serious face and hard eyes? He said, Ojalá te mueras. I hope you die. Don Pedro repeated the phrase many times each day upon rising, upon completing his morning preparations, upon entering and leaving his house at eight o'clock, at one, at two thirty, at seven forty, in the cafe, in the office, before and after every meal, when going to bed each night. He repeated it between his teeth or in a loud voice, alone, or with others, sometimes with only his eyes, always with all his soul. No one knew to whom he addressed these words. Everyone ignored the origin of his hate. Perhaps it was a causeless hate, odio puro, but the feeling nourished him gave seriousness to his life, majesty to his years. Dressed in black, he seemed to be prematurely mourning for his victim. One afternoon, Don Pedro arrived, graver than usual. He sat down heavily, and in the center of the silence that was created by his presence, he simply dropped these words, Yalo mate. I killed him. Who and how? Some smiled, wanting to take the thing as a joke, but Don Pedro's look stopped him. All of us felt uncomfortable. That sense of the void of death was certain. Slowly the group dispersed, Don Pedro remained alone, more serious than ever, a little withered, like a burnt-out star, but tranquil and without remorse. He did not return the next day. He never returned. Did he die? Maybe he needed that life giving hate, odio vivi fi caror. Maybe he still lives and now hates another. <laughs> I examine my actions and advise you to do the same. Perhaps you too have incurred the same obstinate, patient anger of those small myopic eyes. Have you ever thought how many, perhaps very close to you, watch you with the same eyes as Don Pedro? Oh, ho. <laughs>